Welcome to RBC's Markets in Motion podcast, recorded October 30th, 2023. I'm Lori Calvacina, Head of U.S. Equity Strategy at RBC Capital Markets. Please listen to the end of this podcast for important disclaimers. Today in the podcast, we take a deep dive into the stats and commentary for 3Q reporting season as of late last week, with 45% of S&P results in. Three big things you need to know. First, the S&P 500 stats simply aren't strong enough to get the U.S. equity market out of its recent malaise. Second, small cap trends are pretty similar to those in large cap, which is actually good for small caps because large caps no longer have an EPS advantage. Third, in our transcript reading, the overarching theme so far is one of bending, not breaking, but the pessimistic tone is striking. If you'd like to hear more, here's another five minutes. While you're waiting, a quick reminder that you can subscribe to an audio-only version of this podcast on Apple and Spotify. Now the details. Starting with takeaway number one. The S&P 500 stats simply aren't strong enough to get the U.S. equity market out of its recent malaise. Here's what stands out to us on the stats for the S&P so far. For the S&P 500, the percent of companies beating consensus on EPS is 76%, a little higher than last quarter, but the percent of companies beating consensus on sales has moved a bit lower, down to 63%. Tech has the highest percentage of earnings beats along with communication services and energy. The forward look is less constructive, however, as we're still seeing mostly downward revisions for full year 2023 and 2024 forecasts for S&P companies. Most sectors are seeing a slight bias toward downward revisions on both earnings and sales forecasts, aside from energy. The S&P 500 has already been pricing in a strong 2024 EPS recovery beyond what's embedded in current consensus forecasts. For now, the earnings trends that are coming through simply aren't good enough, in our opinion, to help the U.S. equity market get out of its recent malaise. The advantage that growth companies have had relative to value is also shrinking quickly. This highlights one reason why, besides interest rates, crowding, and valuation, the growth trade is stumbling relative to value again. Moving on to takeaway number two, small cap trends are pretty similar to those in large caps, which is good for small caps because large caps no longer have an earnings advantage. Here's what stands out to us on the stats for small caps so far. For the Russell 2000, the percent of companies beating consensus on EPS is tracking a little higher than last quarter, just like the S&P, while the percent of companies beating consensus on sales has fallen a bit. Healthcare has the highest percentage of earnings beats, followed by financials. The forward look is also less constructive for small caps, as we're seeing mostly downward revisions for full year 2023 and 2024 forecasts for Russell 2000 companies. Most sectors are seeing a slight bias toward downward revisions on both earnings and sales forecasts aside from energy, which is seeing positive revisions on both, and healthcare, which is seeing slightly positive revisions to EPS forecasts. Overall, small caps no longer look disadvantaged relative to large caps from an earnings perspective. Both the Russell 2000 and S&P 500 are seeing similar rates of upward earnings estimate revisions. This stands in contrast to most of 2023, when the S&P 500 was seeing stronger rates of upward revisions. It remains to be seen whether this will be enough to help small caps bottom in performance relative to large caps, but it's still a positive development for small. Wrapping up with takeaway number three. In our transcript reading, the overarching theme so far is one of bending, not breaking, but the pessimistic tone is still striking. As has become our custom, our team has read through most of the earnings call transcripts for S&P 500 companies that have reported. Key themes so far from our reading are the conversations on outlooks, demand, and general macro have generally tilted negative. Some companies have emphasized resiliency, stabilization, and normalization, but we're reading a lot more about uncertainty, challenging macro conditions, softening, and caution. The discussion around consumers has seemed a little more balanced between those highlighting resilience and pressures. Variability and selectivity have been recurring topics. Risks and negative impacts from rising rates also stand out. This echoes our quant work, which suggests the recent rise in 10-year Treasury yields has taken the interest rate backdrop to a trouble spot. Pricing discussions continue to highlight moderation and the shift of pricing from a tailwind to a headwind. Inflation and costs are generally still discussed as being problems. On labor, key recurring topics have included moderation in hiring and an improving stabilizing backdrop. There has been a decent amount of commentary about the disruptions caused by the strikes. Geographic commentary has been mixed on Europe and tilted negative on China. A number of companies have referred to geopolitics in the Middle East specifically as something that could impact business conditions or adds to uncertainty. 
On GLP-1, companies have been making an effort to emphasize how there's no clear negative impact or the impact is unclear. And on AI, another key theme, companies are spending more time in the weeds talking about the tangible impact seen so far, the experimentation companies are going through with it, and how it helps companies manage through macro concerns. That's all for now. Thanks for listening. And be sure to reach out to your RBC representative with any questions. This content is based on information available at the time it was recorded and is for informational purposes only. It is not an offer to buy or sell or a solicitation, and no recommendations are implied. It is outside the scope of this communication to consider whether it is suitable for you and your financial objectives.